the topic that I'm going to begin with is the topic of sovereign immunity. Uh, so return with me to Europe uh, back in the good old days of uh, totalitarian monarchies. Uh, justice emanates from the crown and you can't sue the king. Uh, that would be nonsensical, justice emanating uh, from the king. Uh, the king being the fountain of uh, justice uh, can't be susceptible to his own adverse decisions. Uh, this doctrine, uh, which developed over centuries in Europe, is called sovereign immunity. The sovereign is immune uh, from judicial process, from judicial liability. Uh, it's a doctrine that one would think would have been offensive to the founders of the republic, and I'm sure it was to many of them, yet it's a doctrine that upon forming a new country here, they chose to adopt. Uh, so sovereign immunity crosses the Atlantic, sovereignty is vested in a different authority in the United States. It's the people who are sovereign, but the people can't be sued. Uh, the United States is immune from suit, uh, and, and that's just how it is, unless it is willing to waive its immunity and allow itself to be sued. Now that's the, the federal uh, sovereign immunity rule. Uh, it's not in the Constitution. Uh, it's arguably grounded in the structure of the Constitution. Uh, but maybe it's more properly located in federal common law. Uh, there are two other sovereigns uh, operating on uh, the lands uh, that the United States occupies. Uh, the tribes, uh, the native tribes, uh, are sovereign, and they also enjoy sovereign immunity uh, as a consequence of arguably international law, but maybe more expressly federal common law. Uh, and then the states, and it's the states uh, that I want to focus on. Uh, because the issue of state sovereign immunity is something that the founders actually talked about uh, in the Constitution. Uh, the susceptibility of suits to federal judicial process uh, is, is arguably covered in Article III. Uh, and so, so we have constitutional law on that topic. We've got a fair amount of discussion and we've got some interesting history. Uh, I want to share that history with you and then I want to let you know where we are, uh, where we are today. So return with me now. Uh, to 1777. We're at war uh, with the British. Georgia uh, has an army, uh, but they don't have a whole lot in the way of supplies. And the state of Georgia, the newly independent state of Georgia, contracts with a South Carolina merchant named Robert Farquhar to provide a variety of goods uh, that Georgia needs to prosecute the war uh, effort. Uh, the deal is a paper deal. The, the goods arrive and Georgia says, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you. D don't worry, we're good for it. Uh, and 1778 rolls around and 9 and 1780, 91, 92, independence is won uh, or into the 18, 1780s. Uh, new constitution, new government. Uh, Robert Farquhar is uh, Georgia. Uh, remember me? <laughs> you owe me money for that stuff from... The war, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll get around to that. And, and, uh, and eventually, uh, Farquhar dies. <laughs> Decades pass. Nothing comes from Georgia. And his executor, a guy named Alexander Chisholm, uh, decides that he's going to file suit against Georgia or to do something to attempt to recover this debt so that it can be paid into his estate and distributed to his uh, friend Robert Farquhar's. Heirs. Now, can he sue? Well, nobody had ever really asked this question before. This isn't the only unpaid Revolutionary War creditor, mind, uh, but it's the first to ask the question, well, is, is there some way I can use the new federal courts established by Congress pursuant to constitutional directive uh, to, to get this money out of Georgia? And so we took a look at Article Three of the Constitution, which uh, establishes the federal judiciary, and it says that the federal judicial power shall extend to, uh, here, hey, controversies, it says, between a state and foreign uh, states, citizens, uh, or subjects. So, okay, so that sounds like uh, the state of Georgia and, and me, right? I'm uh, Alexander Chisholm, citizen of a, of a different state, South Carolina. He was a South Carolinian like Farquhar. So we file suit, and the Supreme Court gets this case, and Georgia says, what? How, you, can't, you can't sue us, we have sovereign immunity. And Chisholm says, yeah, but it, it says. 
And so it wasn't this copy, but it might have been, right? The little copy of the Constitution. Uh, and so this, the court says, well, I, I don't know. Let's, let's read the language. And four of the five justices decide that Chisholm's right. That, in fact, the federal judicial power does extend to suits brought by citizens of other states against states. So they entertain the action. Uh, and uh, and Georgia is, is very unhappy. Now, it's not just Georgia that's unhappy about this. Other states that owe money are unhappy about the prospect that they're now going to be sued by all of these Revolutionary War creditors. Uh, and so they rally. Uh, and it's almost the first great interstate rally since the Revolution itself. And it's a rally in favor of the 11th Amendment. This is the first amendment since that first group of 10 was pushed through by the first Congress in 1791. Uh, and the 11th Amendment says, here's the deal. I'm going to paraphrase it, then I'll read it to you. Here's the deal. That business about the judicial power extending to suits between states and citizens of other states, that wasn't meant to include suits where the states were the defendants. It was only supposed to include suits where the states were the plaintiffs. So Georgia can sue this guy Chisholm, but Chisholm can't sue Georgia. And here's how it's, it's written. Uh, the judicial power of the United States, and it's adopted, right? So the, the language reads, the judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state, and they threw that in because there were a lot of European bondholders too, right? So individuals now from other states, individuals from foreign countries can't sue states and everybody relaxes, well, everybody being the states relax because now they're no longer going to be liable in federal court to, uh, to suit for payment of these debts on which many of them have defaulted. That's Chisholm versus Georgia uh, and its result. Uh, 1793 is the decision. 11th Amendment is passed almost immediately afterwards. And then time passes. Now, the Civil War comes. The Civil War goes. We're into the, uh, the Gilded Age. And a fellow named Hans in Louisiana uh, has bought bonds from his own state, from the state of Louisiana. And Louisiana, economic difficulty, rewrites its constitution uh, in the 1870s, 1880s, and, and apparently decides that it's not going to pay out on these bonds that Hans has purchased. So Hans says, well, I'm going to sue him in federal court. And presumably someone suggested, well, I don't know if you can do that because the 11th Amendment. Hans says, yeah, but the 11th Amendment says you, you can't sue a state if you're a citizen of a different state or a foreign country. It doesn't say you can't sue your own state in federal court, so we file suit. That case, Hans versus Louisiana, gets decided by the Supreme Court in 1890, and the Supreme Court says, wow, you know, technically Hans is kind of right on the money. That is what it says, but, but in our view, and this is the majority opinion, the reason that it that the, the 11th Amendment didn't expressly prohibit suits by citizens of states against their own state is that everybody assumed that that would be the rule. So even though it doesn't say it, we're going to read that restriction into the 11th Amendment. So the 11th Amendment now says judicial power shall not be construed to extend to suits prosecuted against one of the states by citizens of other states, citizens uh, of foreign states, or citizens of your own state. So that's slipped in by the Hans versus Louisiana decision. All right. So uh, time uh, goes on, uh, and uh, there is a, a First World War. Uh, and in the course of the First World War, uh, a lot of federal money goes to support warring European states, including Great Britain. Uh, and when the war is over, it's time to pay this money back. And a lot of these British bondholders our, 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 or British, the British government uh, in, included, but individuals in Britain too, who are going to be indirectly through taxation liable to contribute to the repayment of this American war debt, say, you know what? We owe the Americans money for, this, for, what they, for the war, but they owe us money too. And, and, 
and, and, and what they had, and these things started appearing out of attics, were these old pre-Civil War state bonds, just like we're talking about, but it's, these are ones that had been sitting in European attics for, for, for generations. Uh, and and they, they had been issued by lots of states, um, including southern states in the years before the Civil War. Um, and then the states had repudiated them. Now, Mississippi was especially notorious for this. Uh, and this is a case that's going to give rise to our final uh, uh, Supreme Court decision in this line. Um, Mississippi in the 1830s, uh, as a lot of states, had gotten really enthusiastic about uh, economic development, about, about banking, uh, and they had chartered two banks, the Planter, Mississippi Planters Bank and the Mississippi Union Bank, and then they issued state bonds to raise money to capitalize these, these, uh, these banks. They sold $7 million worth of bonds, which was a lot of money, and most of them were bought by Europeans, many by, by British speculators, you know, hoping that m the Mississippi banking industry would really take off. Well, it didn't. 1837, there's a financial crisis, and practically all these things went bankrupt corrupt, including these two Mississippi banks. And then the Civil War came. These bonds weren't payable until some 1861, 1865, issued in 1830. A lot happened, <laughs> turns out, between 1830 uh, and 1865 in Mississippi. And so when the war was finished, the state of Mississippi expressly repu repudiated these things. We're never going to pay on these bonds. Uh, and, and European bondholders felt stymied and frustrated. The 11th Amendment prohibited them as individuals, uh, uh, or rather uh, from bringing suit. Uh, individuals uh, in the state couldn't sue because of Hans versus Louisiana. Individuals in other states who held these bonds couldn't sue. So, so what's a bondholder uh, to do? Well, this repayment obligation uh, for the First World War debt combined with the Great Depression inspired some real creative lawyering. And what a group of bondholders finally decided was, okay, well, here are the restrictions. The citizens of states can't sue, citizens of foreign states can't sue, uh, citizens of foreign countries can't sue, but there's nothing in there prohibiting foreign countries from suing. So they collected a bunch of these bonds worth in the tens of thousands of dollars, these old Mississippi planters and union bank bonds and they carried them to the uh, American legation in Paris, 1934, end of September 1934, and they handed them over to the government of Monaco, of the Principality of Monaco. And they said, we give these to you outright, no conditions, do what you will with them, they're all yours. So the Principality of Monaco took these things and immediately filed suit against the state of Mississippi in a federal court. And the thinking was this would get around the problems, the 11th Amendment limitations and the Hans versus Louisiana limitation. Now it's a foreign country suing a state on these bonds, and surely that will be effective. Mind, this would have provided a platform for other countries to do. Everybody could have handed their bonds to Monaco and said, now do ours, right? And eventually Mississippi might have been forced to repay them. All of these things, the Supreme Court got this case in, in 1934, Monaco versus Mississippi, uh, and decided uh, you know, this doesn't seem right either. So Hans versus Louisiana, we inserted citizens of foreign countries. Monaco versus Mississippi, we're going to go ahead and insert and foreign countries can't sue states in federal courts either. So we've had a judicially greatly expanded 11th Amendment uh, scope, of, uh, scope of immunity. Now effectively it reads that suits, uh, federal judicial power doesn't extend to suits brought by citizens of your own state, other states, foreign states, or by foreign countries, any suit in law and equity. Now, that doesn't leave much, right? That doesn't leave much. How in the world do you sue a suit if you think it's done wrong? And not just in not paying bonds, how do you sue a state or how do you get a state to abide by the federal constitution if you think your constitutional rights have been violated? Because this is, this is the federal judicial power. Federal courts ordinarily have jurisdiction to police the Constitution, but we can't bring suits because of the 11th Amendment. Well, there are three ways. There are three things that can happen that get us around this expanded 11th Amendment problem. The first is that the United States can sue. 11th Amendment doesn't bar suits by the United States against, against states. 
uh, if they've violated constitutional requirements. The second is that states can waive their immunity. And that actually happens more than you, more than you might um, think. The federal government does too. The two big statutes at the federal level and their state mirrors, one's the Tucker Act, which is a statute that waives federal sovereign immunity for government contract lawsuits. So you agree, you contract to sell pencils to the federal government, they don't pay you, you can sue them right under the Tucker Act. And then the Federal Tort Claims Act, that's if you get run over by a mail carrier, you can sue if there's a tort that's been committed. And most states, probably all states, have things like that. But that doesn't necessarily help you on constitutional claims. So the last answer, and this is probably the most important, for, certainly for constitutional law purposes, is a 1908 Supreme Court decision created exception called Ex Parte Young. Uh, Edward Young uh, was the Attorney General of the state of Minnesota, charged with enforcing allegedly unconstitutional railroad, state railroad regulations. And, uh, and they couldn't, the railroads couldn't sue the state because of the 11th Amendment, but they thought, maybe we can sue Young, and so they did. So they filed suit against Young, seeking an injunction, a court order, a federal court order to him to stop enforcing these unconstitutional state laws. And the Supreme Court took that and thought, you know, we really haven't left folks many ways, many ways, of challenging unconstitutional action by states. So, so let's, let's go with this. And the ex parte Young rule since 1908 has been the principal mechanism for filing constitutional claims against state governments that you believe have violated your constitutional rights. You can't sue the state, you can't sue for money, but you can sue a state official for an injunction to get him or her to stop enforcing what you to believe, believe to be an unconstitutional, uh, an unconstitutional state act. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.